in Southampton, and I'm joined with my colleague, who's just taking the chair away. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ali. I appreciate that. Um, so today we're going to talk to you about what the book idea is. Ali's going to talk to you about the archaeology, which is probably what we're here for. So if you want a cup of tea, now's a really good time. Um, and then I'm going to bore you with some PhD research I'm doing at the moment, and then conclude with the book in the media. Does that sound sounds like that? Okay. But first of all, the most important question I'm going to ask you all today: What do the following <laughs> images have in common? We've got the gorgeous animal, but even more gorgeous the book of deer. And then, perhaps most gorgeous of all, the humble deep fried mansfell. <laughs> For those who haven't got that quite right, these are all from the northeast of Scotland, just like our good selves here. So, because I can't talk about the deep fried mansfell for 25 minutes at an archaeology conference, because I reckon I'll get kicked out, we're going to actually talk to you about this lovely book instead. So, the Book of Deer, for those of you who don't know, is an 8th to 9th century text, and I'm saying this very non committally because actually we don't know. And you're going to hear a lot of this today. There's a lot of things to just not sure about when it comes to this boys of a book. I'm doing a PhD at the at the moment, so if you feel frustrated, imagine how I feel. Um, the book itself is a pocket gospel. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John is the only complete edition. The book is lovely, you know, it's medieval Matthew, it's kind of cute. But there's something that we're a bit more into as the book goes, and it's actually these lovely Gallic addenda. Now, why are these exciting and important, and what is life and relevance to us now? Well, a couple of different things. First of all, these are the earliest surviving Scots Gallic uh, written pieces, which is very nice. We've got seven editions within it. A lot of them are land grants. We've got the foundation myth of the monastery, so Columba and Droston, and we've also got a piece dedicated to King David the First, so that's where we've got our date. These date between 1100, 1131, and 1132. But, Book's quite annoying for a couple of different reasons. Please don't tell my supervisor I said that, I so probably shouldn't have. Um, the reason we find it quite interesting is because its trajectory is very, very unclear. We don't know where the book was written, we don't even know when it was written, but we sort of understand its trajectory beyond that point. We know that the book itself moves from the Deer Monastery, which is what Ali's going to talk to you about, and then beyond that point, we suspect it probably goes to the adjacent Abbey, Sturge and Bill, in about 1219. From that point onwards, the trajectory becomes really, really difficult to interpret. We know that it ends up in England, but we don't know how. I'm going to talk about this in terms of repatriation a little bit later, but it obviously does make it a bit more complex. From that point on, it then ends up in the possession of Thomas Gale in 1695. In 1697, John Wall, Bishop of Ely, has it. Unfortunately, he passes away, it goes to George I, and he gifts it to Cambridge very kindly as part of a big library in 1715. Now, here's where it gets really weird. Cambridge kind of sits on the text for around 150 years, and then Henry Bradshaw, librarian extraordinaire, kind of rediscovers the text. We get this lovely sort of book of dear renaissance beyond that point, and the trajectory is very interesting again. In the 1970s, Kenneth Jackson gives a lecture on it, and then in the 1990s, it's exhibited in Glasgow. We love Glasgow, but it's not Aberdeen, and that's what we're really talking about today. So it goes back to Cambridge, it's exhibited there in 2016, and then again in 2022, it comes back to the northeast of Scotland. Now we've had a pretty busy uh, pandemic, because we decided, well, we'd also stockpile loo roll. We were gonna, you know, write an NHS grant. Um, and so as part of that grant, it was a sort of triumvirate program. We wanted to have an excavation, 10 weeks, we were looking for the lost monastery. We wanted to have a cultural program, and we wanted the book to return. We're not fully sure what happened, but they said yes. Um, so we were very lucky, and we got all of this money, which was very nice. And I'm going to leave Ali to talk about the excavation. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so uh, as Alice has introduced you to the book, uh, this is the sort of basis for this excavation. And the project, uh, the Book of Deer project, has been going on since about 2009, when there was an annual excavation um, to look for the site of this missing monastery. And I became involved in 2014 when I became their archaeologist and we did this, the annual digs. Um, and Alice became involved in 2016. So we did lots of things like walkovers around the area. I was encouraging the group to look slightly wider than they had been looking and um, just get involved in all sorts of different types of projects. So we did the classic Old Deer, which is the nearest place to the Monastery of Deer, the Abbey of Deer. Um, uh, so we did lots of test pitting uh, all around the village. Uh, which was absolutely amazing. It was really funny. Alice and I went knocking on people's doors, uh, and a, a, a child opened the door and she said, Oh, you're the archaeology wifey. Because every year at the digs, we'd had all the kids, the feeder 
schools up to the secondary school, the nearest secondary school. Uh, and so she persuaded her parents to let us dig in their garden. And so we ended up digging all of these trenches um, and found lots of things about the village, but really nothing much earlier than the sort of 1700s or so, 1600s, 1700s. Um, but we had a great time, and the village really actually really enjoyed it, um, of course, as you, you all know, this sort of uh, immersive sort of test fitting in an area is great fun. Uh, we also uh, looked at the church, so there's a 12th, early 13th century church in the village, um, so we got, unfortunately, now the late Richard Fawcett to come and look at the church and do lots of talks and um, analysis of it, uh, and then we ended up um, doing a geophysical survey. So Rose Geophysics came down from Orkney, um, we've used them before, Historic Mum Scott used them, and we um, got them to look at the graveyard, and then, so Sue from Rose Geophysics, she sent me an email through with the results, but she said nothing. <laughs> and so when I opened this picture, I was like, oh my goodness, is this a structure? Is it an <laughs> earlier church? Um, is it a monastery? And so we were very excited. Um, we looked at the layer plan and we thought, oh my goodness, how are we going to investigate this? <laughs> this is going to be a little tricky. But we persevered and we dug at trenches in between the positions of the gravestones, going down very carefully, not disturbing any human remains, but finding, unfortunately, that that pattern that looks so promising is actually made up by demolition material of various sorts. The church has had a huge amount of work done to it over the last few hundred years, and that was all created by different types of demolition material. So that wasn't that was an interesting start. Um, and we did find out a lot about the church, so lots about the, the graveyards and the church, and um, a lot of disarticulated human remains, which allowed us to do um, work with the students and people involved in the dig. So then, by various routes, so we went and looked at lots of different places, and eventually I took them back to Deer Abbey, which is a standing structure. It's a sort of almost a folly because the landowners, since it was demolished, have changed it quite dramatically. But this field, at the bottom of the picture, when I went into the field, I said, come on, let's, let's investigate this. And so the project did read, and again, we got the road geophysics down. Now, um, very little was clear. The dark lines are to do with this being uh, a landscaped garden for the estate, um, which was landscaped around from around about 1800. But there were areas where they thought that uh, there, is, there might be archaeology underneath, and so we started by putting in small trenches in 2017, 2018, um, and then, as Alice mentioned, we did this Heritage Lottery Fund project in 2022. Um, and we found some really interesting things. Um, nothing specifically early medieval in date, nothing specifically pre the Abbey, which was started in 1219, but we did find some really interesting things, including this Nefertafel gaming board on the left, which uh, made the world news all over the place, and um, is a fantastic little board. We've actually got now from the 2022 dig several other boards, which um, we've yet to be studied. Um, but we also, we find in this handmade pottery, which I'd wondered if that was early medieval in date, but it's uh, handmade in the, as you can see, the 13th, 14th century. And so in 2022, we realised we're going to need bigger trenches to interpret all of this. Um, what you should know about uh, sites in Aberdeenshire is that they're often these rural sites have been heavily farmed. So this man uh, who set up this, the walled garden has uh, moved a lot of soil around to do lots of gardening things, and also then medi a medieval ribbon furrow before that. So these sites are often very, very disturbed. So we started, obviously, on the, the dig, we destroyed nothing, of course, as we went down. We tried to remain, keep things in situ as much as possible to allow us to get down to the bottom. And we found some really interesting things that were associated with the Abbey, um, and then started to get down to earlier deposits. So if we're looking for a monastery, we obviously were looking for a ditch. So we found a ditch. Not a huge ditch, but a nice ditch. Nothing dateable in it until we got the dating materials, which I'll come on to in a moment. And then, quite near the end of the dig, because obviously going down, you know, it wasn't that we were doing a time team thing, we just had three days left, or, but um, 
you know, we were getting down to the bottom, we started to find these post holes. And again, this is not stunning, this is not stunning map Hope Jersey archaeology things. But this for us is really exciting because although we couldn't date these post holes, obviously at, the, at that time, uh, again, the dating evidence uh, was going to be absolutely crucial for this. So when we got the dating back, we were really, really amazed that we've got this early phase in green, which again is really not, not amazing looking archaeology, but to have from mid 7th to mid 8th century um, this ditch and some post holes. Um, I've put on some later features there to show you how complex it is. And then to go on into the mid 10th to early 12th century into an area of burning and a half and more post holes. Um, and then in the purple here, we've got three post holes in a line, which I discussed with the regional archaeologist before I actually realised the significance of these mid 12th to early 13th century. But this is probably the earliest Cistercian buildings when they were building in wood prior to, to building in stone. Um, and then in another trench, uh, industrial areas or halves, uh, again sort of overlapping the uh, mid 12th to early 13th century period. Um, and one with a ditch around it with a, uh, stake holes for a windbreak, um, as you can see. An, an illustration below here by Jan Dunbar, who's an Aberdeenshire uh, artist and archaeologist. Uh, and then one of the things that the volunteers, this is a project which we had hundreds of volunteers literally on this project over the years. One of the archaeologists volunteers here, uh, this path which absolutely stunned everybody. Um, we, it was called Premler's Path because on the right is the volunteer Premler who had found it and who stayed overnight to excavate it when we were running a little behind. And we eventually uh, uncovered the, the amount that we could within the um, 2022 excavation. So it seems to run out at the bottom and at the top, there's a road which was uh, an estate road and there are fields in, uh, off the top of the picture. And so we're hoping that the path maybe does go a little further. But definitely something that you'd find in a sort of monastic setting. You know, this is not something that an ordinary person in Aberdeenshire has laid. Um, and this is in the 11th, 12th century. Um, yeah, so with the halves here again, and you've got this sort of mid 12th to 13th century date from the 2022 halves as well. Um, and this wonderful um, broken coin stone, which was in a linear feature, been set into a linear feature. Um, and a date much, much earlier than we had imagined. I imagined it was to do with the Abbey, but 11th to 12th century. And so again, a summary of the sort of, this multi sort of period site that we're talking about. And so we think with the, um, Aberdeenshire is not stuffed full of these Pictish early medieval sites. I mean, it just really isn't. And so the combination of the ditch, the postals, and the dating, the phasing, the path in the kilns, and we think it's very likely that we have found the uh, site of the monastery in which the um, book which Alice didn't show you, but I'm sure she's going to show you in a minute. We didn't take this from Cambridge or this one for the day. Uh, we, had re we had models made of it, so. Uh, and again, this is maybe what it looked like as they were starting to build the stone um, abbey, the wooden buildings and the path. So I'm going to hand you back now to Alice to talk the rest of the period. I hope I didn't overrun it. So we were very lucky because alongside the excavation that ran about 10 to 12 weeks, we also had a cultural program alongside it. Um, and this comprised of a lot of different things. So we had a banner program, we had jewellery making, we had concerts, all the sort of things you kind of love to see with an archaeology project. But we also had something that I think is for me the most exciting part of the project, aside from the archaeology itself. And this is the short-term loan of the book to Aberdeen Art Gallery. Now, we kind of think of 2021 as the year where everybody said yes to us, and we probably should have asked for, like, I don't know, the lottery numbers or something. <laughs> um, but basically what happened was we asked Cambridge if they would loan the book, and we thought it was going to be like, absolutely not, what are you talking about? And they said yes. And we were like, right, well, ask the art gallery. We said, art gallery, can we possibly exhibit the book here? And they were like, absolutely, of course you can. And they were a bit panicked because we had to get all the money. So thankfully, the NHS said yes too. But I'm going to talk to you a bit about my PhD, and this is basically me just showing you my holiday photos, so sorry about this in advance. But I want to talk about the three kind of themes 
that my PhD revolves around, and this is going to be really nice because I've got my sort of confirmation viva next week, so hopefully this is a bit scarier than the viva itself, <laughs> um, is kind of my plan. If you, have, if you like anything that I've said today, please come and talk to me. If you don't like it, please leave me be. Um, but if you've got any questions about this or whatever, please, please come and give me some preparatory material for next week. Um, so my PhD kind of has like three key themes to it, and the first is the theme of access. And I've got the lovely Trinity University Library with um, its beautiful tower up there. Um, and I kind of want to talk about themes of access, but before I sort of start on that, I really need to give a sort of disclaimer, which is that I really like Cambridge. And I went to Oxford, so you must know how much that pains me to say. <laughs> <laughs> but we love the librarians, we think they're fab. They are so generous with their time and with their knowledge and their expertise. And everything I'm about to say kind of comes from this place because it's, it's going to be interesting. So, to access the book at Cambridge University Library is a little bit complicated. We've had records of people being denied access in the late 90s when Scottish Parliament was being consumed. Um, so there is a sort of legacy along that that is political as well as personal. When you want to see the book, you have to contact the librarians, all this kind of usual archival paraphernalia. So we thought, wouldn't it be fun if the book could come back? Scotland, particularly the North East. Now, we were really worried, actually, when it came back. So we were like, oh, God, what if it's just me sitting there day after day looking at the book and nobody else comes? Um, and thankfully, it wasn't. It's quite nice with me and Ali sitting, looking at the book day after day and no one else came. Um, no, we had 67,000 people come and look at this book, which we were absolutely delighted by. We also thought, you know, quantity of response is great, but quality of response would be quite nice, too. And people came up to us afterwards and they were telling us all sorts of things. We had people come and say, you know, I prayed in front of this book, or I wept in front of this book, or one person said, I played it bagpipe music, because I didn't really like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting very different styles of like emotional response to the text, which we're really, really pleased by. But unfortunately, now the book sits in this lovely velvet box, which you have to be in a box, it's quite a nice one to be in, but we reckon that's probably kind of a problem in terms of being able to see the text. The book is often compared to like, the Book of Kells in terms of significance to Scotland as a country, um, and we feel like that's probably quite true, and so in line with that, a long-term loan is something we'd definitely like to discuss, and if Cambridge is here today, please come and see me at the end. <laughs> But it would be very rude to talk about what is arguably a community archaeology project without actually talking about the community. So that's what I'm going to do now, because that's my next theme for my PhD. So, kind of difficult. so, as Ali said, we have the most wonderful community to come and dig with us. And we think that actually community projects like this are so, so important, particularly post COVID, particularly in the northeast of Scotland. We feel that actually there's a huge benefit both for the archaeology and to the community in doing projects like this. You know, we see people around town who go for cup of tea with them. But also we become better archaeologists in light of this. Because people will ask us questions that we haven't necessarily thought about, or they'll look at the site in a very different way and be like, do you think you could do that? We've had people who want to do water demanding on site, and we said, yes, absolutely. There's no reason why we can't try these very different techniques because it helps us to become better archaeologists and better members of the community. And we think that that's probably one of the strongest aspects of this dig. But I obviously can't talk about all of this lovely stuff without talking about the theme of repatriation, which is something that keeps cropping up, largely in the want of the SNP, which I'll just sort of allude to in a minute. Now, the Book of Deer itself is a very interesting repatriation case for a couple of different reasons. It's not like the other post boys, it's not like sort of Ben and Bronson, the Parthenon sculptures, for a couple of different reasons. The first is that actually, technically, Cambridge is part of the same sort of country unit as um, Aberdeen, so it's a little bit more complicated in that regard. It's not so clear-cut, even if it is 500 miles away. If anybody's tried to do that journey, don't. It's terrible. <laughs> um, but beyond that point as well, there's a couple of other reasons why it's a little bit different. The other thing is that we don't know the trajectory of this text. We are not sure how it came to England, and we think that does make it a little more complicated, because with other cases of repatriation, it's a little bit clearer. And the final thing is that the Book of Deer is a one-off object. It's not like the Lewis Chessman, you can't split it up. You have to have an all or nothing thing. Although someone did come to me at talk and suggest me rip some pages out, and I felt a bit <laughs> sick, so please don't do that. Um, so the SNP have obviously been lobbying for quite a considerable period of time, I think since I was born, which is a really long time ago, um, to bring the book back. And so that's something that's going to regain and enter discussion once more. But we want to obviously talk a little bit about the book in the media, largely because you know we had a documentary and we just wanted to kind of plug it, but also um, because we were very, very fortunate in this regard. 
And so our first documentary came out in 2018, and it was maybe a slightly disappointing documentary because we didn't find the monastery. Um, so it was just an hour of watching people in the northeast get very, very wet and dig a hole, which like, you can only watch that for quite so long. Um, but then we had our most recent documentary come out in November last year, yes. Um, and we were very fortunate with this. We actually managed to sort of lobby the BBC and they agreed to put it on last Tuesday and again tomorrow night, so you have no excuse not to watch it. Um, but we were very fortunate on that. Look, lovely. But we did actually, as Ali's already mentioned, we believe we found the monastery. And the thing that we were most excited about this was this was evidence of the importance of all the work that we put in and all the effort that we put in, but also all the effort and the time of our lovely, lovely volunteers. So we thought, what better way to conclude than obviously we made a lovely cake of our site, because that's clearly what you do when you should be writing your thesis. <laughs> um, we thought it was a really good way to celebrate, particularly Pramila's gorgeous path. So I just want to conclude with a couple of thanks, and then we're also going to talk about um, what I've told you today and what we told you today, and then we'll open the floor to any questions. But we just want to thank everybody who took part in this project. We wouldn't have been able to dig without one of our lovely volunteers. We definitely wouldn't have been able to dig without the NHS. And I wouldn't have been able to dig without Ali, and I can't compliment her too much, because she'll start to blush, and then she won't answer any questions for me later. Um, but thank you. So, to conclude, what have we talked you about today? We've had a good discussion about what the Book of Deer is. We've explained its value and significance to the northeast of Scotland. Um, we've also discussed the archaeology. I've shared a photo that Ali expressly told me not to put in the presentation. <laughs> um, and then we've talked about the cultural programme, we've talked about the loan of the book, and also the music. Thank you so much for listening to us today. It really does mean the world. And if you've got any questions for us, please let us know. Yes, uh, thank you both. What, what an interesting talk. Um, same procedure applies. If you've got a question, please stick your hand in the air and please wait for the mic to come to you. Uh, we've got a, a, a question down at the front. Thank you. project at the moment that Cambridge are doing called Beast to Book, where they're trying to establish precisely what vellum it was. But you said something really interesting about that last time, just now. You should try, you're embarrassing me now. Because <laughs> I said the impression of the calf. Did you say, how many calves is it that goes to make the Book of Deer? 14 yeah. or something, you know, it's just a number like that. I was saying that they could have put their calf under their arm and carried it from Ireland to the south of Scotland or, I mean, we're not sure where it was made, but yes, it's, it's vellum. But there's an ongoing project. Yes, but that will date when the book itself is written, not when the Gallic agenda were added, so there's like a slight discrepancy in those times. Yeah. Well, uh, right down at the very front, if, if you can get the mic any more this way. Gentlemen, right in the front row. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. And why is it called the Book of Deer if you mentioned that it might have come or possibly come from Ireland? Well, what, what's the evidence that it's linked with deer? So it's not deer, the animal. Deer is. No, no, animal. I didn't mean that. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, um, yes, because it's a short talk, we obviously couldn't go into everything, right? But essentially, the glam grants talk about places around about deer, old deer, um, and, and some of the other places. And so that was when Alice was mentioning in the 19th century, was it? Yes. they recognised that these, at least Gaelic, was mentioning places in Aberdeenshire that were linked it to the Abbey of Deer in Aberdeenshire. Um, and obviously that's where we've been digging. So well, why did you mention it may have come from Ireland, but under the arm of So the, orig the original book is the, is the Latin Gospels, yes. and then in the margins, this, this Gaelic yes. has been written. And so the original book, we don't know where it was written, but we know that it was in Aberdeenshire in the 12th century. It's a bit like a Banksy. Um, you've got, like, the wall is really nice, like we love the book, but we think the Gallic is the thing that's really special and that's kind of the graffiti. But there's a couple of academics who actually suggest that like, the Gallic is the reason this book survived for quite so long. And so the project that we were talking about will date the book 
with the vellum, and so therefore the original, or we'll, we'll source the original book. But we are obviously interested more in the Aberdeenshire uh, Liscalic. Do you know any more? Oh, sorry, uh, down, down at the front of the side there. Thank you very much for the talk, that was very interesting. I, I'm a librarian myself, so it's nice to get a shout out for the you know, community there. Um, and the community is actually the question I was going to ask you about. I was wondering if you could talk more about the community aspect, especially the, the role you play for schools and the local village children. Um, I mean, did any of them really get into your ecology based on the project you were giving them, like the opportunity you had there? I mean, that's definitely happened in projects that we've worked on. Uh, we actually haven't really followed the kids who have gone through the, up to the secondary, because unfortunately we tried to get the secondary kids to come, and that's really impossible. You know, their timetables are so busy. And, um, but just going by the feedback that we got walking around and meeting people and the kids, every single primary feeder up to the secondary got, um, you know, on the dig at least once. And we always asked them, and some of them came three times, you know, with their class. That's so brilliant. absolutely yeah. brilliant. We sometimes we just had classes day, day after day, and they just they're fantastic. They're keen and they're excited when they find a bit of pottery or a bone. So it was uh, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. That was great. Yeah. Great. I think unless there's any more questions, I mean, yeah, I need stronger glasses to give me a wave. If you, you, I'm not speaking to you, but I think I might be able to understand. Yes. In which case, um. Thank you both for a really, really interesting talk, and I'm, I'm sure we're going to wish Alice a lot of good luck for her library as well. <laughs>